welcome, welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming out again today. My name is Patrice Merritt. I'm vice chair of the Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory Foundation Board. I see a lot of familiar faces here, people who have been here before. Thank you for coming back. And to anyone who hasn't been here in the last of our three-part series, you're in for a real treat. Um, first order of business, please turn off your cell phones. This is as a courtesy to our speaker and to your fellow attendees. And, and I'm just here to remind you that the foundation is the institution that supports all the enrichment activities of the library. So this program today, some collection development issues are provided by private donations, foundation grants, and just individuals who share in our passion for literacy, libraries, and lifelong learning. Um, so to that end, I have to tell you about some really great upcoming events that are happening this week. Tomorrow night at 7 p.m., the Rancho Mirage Cultural Commission, one of our community partners, is presenting a premiere screening of a documentary entitled Jack Rather, A Legacy of Film and Friendship with the producers Alan K. Road and Stephen C. Smith present. This is interesting. This is a remarkable story of a Texas millionaire who went on to create film noir, then went to Disney, operated and created the Disneyland Hotel, and then finally went into TV production and produced shows such as Lassie and the Lone Ranger. So the producers will be here, it'll be an hour long and there'll be a Q&A. Um, and this weekend, this is a premier event for us and our children. You will not want to miss our youth theater presentation of Disney's Aladdin. Um, this is taking place at the beautiful Rancho Mirage Amphitheater in a full production. This is orchestral, costumes, as well as choreography and stage drama like you have not seen before. Our young thespians have been working since September to bring this production to the live stage. It is already sold out for Saturday, but there are tickets still available on Sunday, and it is open to the public, so just check our website for tickets to that event. This is generously funded by the Richard Brook Foundation. This is the third, I believe, production of this kind. Believe me, if you were to come in this room three weeks ago, you would have seen young people dancing, getting lines, practicing their exits with staging that is unfathomable. So please, um, Sunday afternoon or Sunday evening should be fun. It is only one hour long. I don't want you to think you're gonna be there for multiple acts. Um, and now to our main event. Chef Shannon Bush has been a plant-based chef for over 30 years. She has served as executive chef, head baker, caterer, and culinary instructor, and I suspect she's done everything in a kitchen that possibly needs to be done. She generously shares her knowledge of the many health benefits of plant-based food, not only that it is healthy, but that it tastes great. Um, today is the last, as I said, in her series of three, and today we are visiting not an extravagant place around the world, but today's menu is Americana. Um, so. I just learned today, there's been a lot of interest in Shannon's program, that yes, she will be back in April for a three-week stint. It'll be three consecutive weeks instead of one a month. So check our program guides. Our newest one is out, please take one. This is through February, but keep checking in with us and Shannon will be back in April. So it is my great privilege and privilege to bring to you Chef Shannon. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the nice intro. So today's program is going to be a little different. Um, we have a special guest today. And I'm really excited to introduce you to a young, up-and-coming chef. Um, so when I started this 30 years ago, it was like pulling teeth, trying to get people to think about the connection between what they ate and their health. And so now there's this new generation of people coming along that are cooking with plants, getting people excited about eating plants. And I don't think he's gonna have the uphill battle that I had. Hopefully you won't be hitting your head against the wall like I did so many times over the years. Uh, but this is Chef Brian Lopez Lopez. He is also known in the Valley as El Taco Titan. <laughs> he makes phenomenal home-style Mexican food using traditional family recipes, but 
his twist, his new generation. The addition to these recipes is that everything is made with plants and only plants. So he's here today to keep me company, help me out, and then um, after I make a couple of recipes, he's going to show you how to make a holiday turkey substitution. So um, let's get started. I'm not used to having company up here. It's kind of exciting. <laughs> is my mic on? Oh, yeah, it is. It is. It is. So welcome, Brian. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you, guys. <laughs> So um, today's recipe is Americana, easy comfort food that's been cleaned up and uh, veganized, plant-based. Um, we're going to start with my take on classic sloppy joes. So I'm going to get started here. And I'm going to saute some vegetables. And I'm going to use a little water rather than oil today. Either one works fine. And I'm going to just saute a mixture of onions and bell pepper. Join us up here too. The three of us. Is it okay? Is it? Am I okay? Can you hear me? No? <laughs> I'm okay? Oops. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, all right. Onions and bell peppers. I get a lot of questions about my knife. Um, the blade is called a Santoku blade. I love it. Um, you can use it as a scoop because it's nice and wide. But uh, all the major knife makers make a blade shaped like this, Santoku. I usually use avocado oil when I'm sauteing something. I know a couple of people here have um, told me that they really try and avoid oil, so using a little bit of water is also fine. Just make sure that um, you monitor the level of water. You want it ultimately to all be cooked out by the time you carry on with the recipe. <laughs> okay. I'm going to add a little garlic. I think on the recipe I gave you, I said one clove, but my cloves are kind of small, so I'm going to add two. So the star of this dish, there's so 
many different ways to make sloppy joes. You can do it with lentils. You can do it with one of the uh, popular ground beef substitutes like Impossible Beef or Beyond Burger. But I'm going to use something that's shelf-stable. That's one of the reasons I love this product. This is um, by Bob's Red Mill, and it's called TVP. It stands for Textured Vegetable Protein. So um, it's nice because unlike the other options, it's not perishable. It's just something to have in the pantry for one of those days when you want to you know, whip up a quick meal. Pretty easy to find around the valley. You can find it at Whole Foods, Sprouts. I order more and more things on Amazon these days. Okay, so while this sautés, I'm going to combine my liquid ingredients. I'm going to start with a cup and a half of water. at the Asian class last time. So those of you that were here before know how much I love to use coconut aminos. It's a great substitute for soy sauce, for those of you that aren't familiar with it. It still adds the great flavor to whatever you're cooking, but it has a lot less sodium. So it's a lot better option for many things instead of soy sauce. I'm actually going to follow the recipe I wrote up this time because <laughs> I never do. And for those of you that are here last time, I think some of you had to point out things I was forgetting. <laughs> that was a little embarrassing. So, <laughs> so I'm going to make sure I follow the recipe. And I adjusted this recipe about three times yesterday before I finally set it in stone. Thank you. See? You guys are good uh, backups or good support team. So I have that. We'll do some pepper and some granulated onion. You can't have too much granulated onion in your life. Even when I cook with fresh onions, I always add the granulated onion. It really helps get that flavor all throughout your dish. It's garlic salt. It's a little extra garlic. So hopefully the library staff is okay with garlic today. They're getting a double dose. And we're going to put some mustard in there. Put a couple tablespoons of ketchup. This adds a little tanginess because of the vinegar. And a small can of tomato sauce. I forget anything? Thank 
you. <laughs> you guys are paying attention. The tablespoon is all dirty, so I'm going to... Who knows how many teaspoons in a tablespoon? You guys are good. Okay, my water has just about evaporated. The vegetables are just starting to get tender. So I'm going to go ahead and add this liquid mixture. And now, our TVP. It's Soy. Welcome, by the way. Nice to see you again. It's been a few years. <laughs> so, I'm curious, how many of you were here for um, Dr. Greger's talk? A few of you, okay. So, um, Dr. Greger shared a study recently about the benefits of uh, having soy on a regular basis. And uh, it uh, drastically reduces the chances of prostate cancer in men and also uh, drastically reduces the uh, occurrences of breast cancer in women. So um, that's a study that he has shared on his, uh, his site, nutritionfacts.org. I know a lot of people have been scared of soy in the past, but um, I think uh, the opinion is uh, changing on that in the medical community. So this just takes a few minutes for these little uh, pieces of uh, soy to hydrate and take on the flavor of the sauce. So while that happens, I'll maybe have um, Brian start setting up. Um, we're just going to do like little slider si size the sloppy joes. Question? So about the same amount, like if you were to substitute cooked lentils, about the same amount, about a cup and a half cooked. Not dry. You'd end up with a lot of lentils if you <laughs> <laughs> but cooked the same amount. Mm -hmm. The whole platter? I mean the whole box? Yes. So it's a quick meal, comfort food that comes together in just a few minutes. And like I said, the thing I love about that is it can just sit in the pantry and it's not going to spoil. Um, it looks like ground beef, like ground beef, similar. This, the only ingredient, it has one ingredient, soy. So the sodium content is up to you. Uh, I put a teaspoon in this recipe because there isn't any in the TVP. Uh, and I start with a cup and a half of water, so I feel that it needs some sodium. And then the uh, coconut aminos adds a little bit. That's a good question. I'm not sure. The question was whether or not it has less sodium than low sodium soy sauce. The um, uh, low sodium soy sauce usually has 700 milligrams per tablespoon, so um, I'm not sure how much that one has. Let's find out. Oops. So 9% of the daily value or 200 milligrams per tablespoon. Yeah, way less. If you're not familiar with it, give it a chance. I really like it. It's really versatile. Um, it's made from the nectar of a coconut blossom. So 
So, Brian, this is the first time you've cooked with me. Yeah. When I cook, I always have a stack of clean spoons next to whatever I cook. So, come on over. Oh, that's what you were insinuating. <laughs> is, it, is it, like, is it going to boil my mouth? I don't think so. <laughs> I kind of half expected you to, like, spoon, spoon, spoon feed me. <laughs> Tell me how if my seasonings are okay. It's really good. These people kept me on Amazing. course with the recipe, so should be okay. I don't think you missed anything in there, right? Right. It's and good. is the uh, is that hydrated and soft? The PVC? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very beefy. There goes my sound again. This has never happened before. I don't know what the problem is. Couldn't be me, right? <laughs> Did it? Okay, now I'm taped. I can't smile, so don't make me laugh. <laughs> hey, what do I do with this spoon? So, I have a clean stack and I have a dirty stack. Right, we we can start the dirty stack over here. Got it. All right, so if you want to put these together for us. It's hot, so maybe like so. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. So the library staff gets a little snack today from us. So while Brian puts those together, I'm going to start on the mushroom gravy. Very sloppy. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Nothing neat and tidy about eating a sloppy joe. So. No shame in that. <laughs> Can you smell it? Does it smell good? Should I make them sloppier? Yeah, load them up. Got it. We want the library staff to get it on their nice uh, business clothing. <laughs> so the holidays are coming next week, as a matter of fact came up quickly for me, um, I thought I would give you a gravy recipe. So this is a gravy recipe or a mushroom gravy recipe I use over, I've used over the years and sometimes I'll, uh, instead of a clear gravy with cornstarch, I'll use flour and oat milk so that it's more of a creamy gravy, but this year I've decided we're doing the clear gravy. Uh, I'm using water and cornstarch instead of using milk and flour to thicken it.
Okay, so for this one, I'm gonna cook my mushrooms and onion in uh, some vegan butter. People ask me all the time about which brands to use. Um, there didn't used to be, but now there are so many good tasting ones that um, it's hard to go wrong. But the one I'm using today is uh, made with avocado oil. And uh, it's really easy to find. It's by Country Crock. Um, Country Crock Croc also makes an olive oil butter and an almond milk butter. But um, I like the avocado oil. And then I brought one of these. It also comes in a little tub or you can get the sticks. The sticks are great for baking. If you're trying to switch towards plant-based plant eating and you're trying to slowly swap out your ingredients like your butter, if you're gonna eat something where you'll really notice the flavor of butter, I highly recommend trying Miyoko's butter. She um, has a delicious butter substitute, but it's pretty expensive. So it's not something I would use for baking where you're not gonna really notice the flavor. But it's great if you're trying to find a substitute for your morning toast or something like that. Beautiful. Show this off? A little parsley. Oh yeah, you're right, you're right. <laughs> okay, we're gonna let any kind of mushrooms work. Um, I always tell people just how do you choose mushrooms? Well, clean. You want clean mushrooms because you never want to wash a mushroom. If it does have some dirt on it, you just want to take a damp dishcloth and just wipe the dirt off. Mushrooms are very porous. If you wash them in water, they're going to soak up the water and they're going to be watery. They won't absorb the flavors of your dish. So never wash your mushrooms. The other thing is make sure the cap is tightly closed to the stem. That means this mushroom is fresh. And whenever you're trying to cut something round and wobbly, cut it so that you have a flat edge. That way it doesn't wobble. Yes, they do. So uh, she asked if I take the gills out of portobello mushrooms. Any large mushroom like that, um, if you don't remove the gills, it affects the flavor of the mushroom. Um, it, my best way to describe it is it kind of has a swampy taste to it when you don't remove the gills. These smaller mushrooms, it, it doesn't affect the flavor, but uh, the large ones, like the portobellos, I do recommend just taking a spoon and scraping the gills out. Yes. Yeah, so when it, it opens up from the cap, it's the little brown things inside, and they scoop right out with a spoon. Those are beautiful, if I do say so. <laughs> they are beautiful. Well, they're very sloppy. There's nine, but uh, I was very generous, so I think you could uh, probably do about 12 total. Okay, so while my mushrooms and onions cook, I'm going to mix the liquid ingredients together. 
And like I mentioned, you can use uh, plant milk instead of water, but I'm using water today. And the first thing I'm going to do is add my cornstarch. So I like the gravy a little on the thin side. So I, did, I think I put a note in there. If you want it a little thicker, just add, increase the amount of cornstarch by a teaspoon. So it's important to mix your cornstarch before you add it to the pan. Anybody want to tell me why? Right, you'll get lumps that you'll never be able to break up if you put it in the hot mixture. So, what did I say? A tablespoon? So you just want to stir it really well until it dissolves. Make sure there aren't any clumps. Okay, so let's add the rest of our ingredients. We've got coconut aminos again. I try to use these products in multiple ways so that you don't feel like you're getting something for one recipe and then you'll never use it again. I want to give you multiple ways to use these things. And we do have a bottle of coconut aminos that's going to be a door prize today, so aren't you lucky? <laughs> you can. It has a little bit different flavor to it. I have both at home, and I always go to this one. Just enjoy the flavor a little more. But a similar idea. They both have all nine amino acids in them. Okay, what else do we have in there? We've got uh, some pepper. Some onion, is that right? <laughs> and then some of this, this is a really fun thing. This is also a door prize today. This is from Trader Joe's. It's a multi-purpose umami seasoning. And it's a blend of uh, powdered mushroom, salt, red pepper, black pepper, thyme, ground mustard seed, onion. It's a great combination, and it adds a phenomenal flavor to this gravy. Trader Joe's. Oh, uh, multi-purpose umami. Any kind of sauce or marinade, it's perfect in the gravy. Um, we cook a lot of Asian food in my house, and it's something to throw in that enhances just about everything. What did I say, about a teaspoon and a half? Thank you. Uh, 140 milligrams and a quarter teaspoon. Okay. 
Okay, my mushrooms are just starting to brown. Wow, they look really good. <laughs> so I'm going to add in our liquid. Thank you. Yeah. Those of you that sit in the front row, your job is to keep me honest with the recipe. That also was very small, so we need to throw another one in there. Yes, it is really old and it's from the Pampered Chef. And someone told me the last class or the one before that you can still buy them online. But it's the best garlic press ever because you don't have to peel your cloves. You just put everything in there and it cleanly, it cleanly uses the whole clove of garlic, leaves the, uh, the husk in the, peel, in the press. Okay, it's time to add the liquid. And you want to keep stirring it until it thickens. It doesn't take long for the water to heat and the cornstarch to do its magic. Can you smell it? Smell good? Yes. You can. It does change the consistency a bit. But something like this, you could freeze this gravy and get good results. So one of the recipes I'm giving you is a meatless meatloaf recipe. And I thought it would take me too long to make it in front of you, so help okay. me with the... The mashed potato? Yeah. So I was going to heat these up ahead of time. I've got some horseradish mashed potatoes. So um, these are cold. They're supposed to be hot, but that's okay. <laughs> oh, we will. Like a, like a little smiley face? Uh, sure. Whatever. Your discretion. I've never used one of these before. Oh. Is it like an ice cream scooper? It's a food scooper. Oh. Yeah. Makes your food look pretty. Something I always used in restaurants to make it. And if they were warm, it would make you a nice little hill. So There's a hill going on. Okay. <laughs> right. Exactly. Is that pretty?
So come on back. There's our little meatloaf. And then let's just uh, Smells good. slice it. So I cook all kinds of different ways with different ingredients. So I tailored this recipe thinking of the holidays and friends gathering. And you might be a plant-based eater, but maybe your guests, your family members are not. So I tailored this recipe to kind of please the masses. If it was just for me, just for my family, um, I probably would have used all lentils, but um, using a meat substitute gives this a broader appeal. Or if you're new to plant-based cooking, I think the meat substitutes um, are a great tool to help you slowly get away from animal products. Do I think that you should eat them day and night? Always, no, but use them as a tool to get yourself used to eating without uh, having your meals centered around an animal product. Uh, same amount, but you'll need um, something in there for a little structure like some quick cooking oatmeal. Um, if you want a recipe for that, send me an email. My email address is on there and I can give you that recipe. So let's go ahead and make that look pretty on there. No, these. The mashed potatoes are um, Yukon Gold potatoes, for starters. I think they make the best mashed potatoes. And uh, I always leave the peels on. There's all that fiber and vitamins that aren't present inside the potato that are in that peeling. So leave your peel on. Um, but uh, gold potatoes, a little bit of plant-based butter, um, some horseradish, and uh, garlic, onion, salt and pepper. Wouldn't happen to have a little oil. Yes, thank you. Uh, some oat milk. Oat milk. Mm -hmm. All right, so I did bring a ladle, yay. Looks really good. Need some greenery. Is there any parsley left? Oh no, I got very sloppy with it. <laughs> Just a little bit. It just needs a splash of color. Right on the mushrooms or the meat mix? Um, just a cup and a half of liquid, so yeah, it's a pretty small recipe. You could always double it if you have a big group coming for Thanksgiving. I'll try the gravy. Of course. <laughs> no pressure. Let me just add some <laughs> green to it. Oh, no. there we go. That's what happens when you get too sloppy. <laughs> get a mushroom. No pressure, but there's a hundred people watching. Mm. <laughs> That's really good. I love mushrooms, so anything with mushrooms is really good. Okay, the library is going to eat well today, but the potatoes are cold, just fair warning. Okay. 
Okay, so I have one more recipe I'm going to make for you before I hand things over to Chef Brian. And I'm just going to give you a little backstory with this cranberry recipe. I figured Thanksgiving is next week. Maybe you would be interested in a savory cranberry sauce rather than a sweet one. And I'm a recipe developer. That's what I do. I don't use other people's recipes. I rarely even look at other people's recipes. However, this recipe got in front of me a few years ago. And I absolutely love it. And I wouldn't change a thing about it, which I never feel that way. I always want to tweak and adjust and add my own touch. But if you like horseradish, and if you are interested in trying a savory recipe for cranberries, give it a try. The only thing I did was uh, veganize it. It's um, the true recipe calls for regular sour cream and a little bit of sugar, but I use uh, vegan sugar and uh, vegan sour cream. How is vegan sugar regular, different than regular sugar? It's a great question. So regular sugar does not have animal products in it. However, animal products, gelatin, is used in the filtering process. So the sugar syrup is made, then it goes through a gelatin filter. So I think the idea of gelatin is awful. It's ground up cattle hooves. So getting around that, not using that process, I think is a really good idea. I think the United States are the only country that really do that method. So if you go anywhere else, uh, they don't allow that. Uh, but uh, if you get organic sugar, that, that's not made out of bone, bone char. So you know, for the most part, you should be good. But yeah. Organic sugar. And then in this valley, there's a brand that's really easy to find. It's called Zulka, Z-U-L-K-A, I believe. And uh, on the front of it, it says bone char free. Um, it is a vegan product. It's not organic, but it's really easy to find in this valley. I think every store I can think of has it. So um, it's not. It's it's the pieces are irregular, the coloring is irregular, there'll be some brown, some white, some beige. So the gelatin filter, what that does is makes it all a uniform white. So it cooks the same, it tastes the same, the only difference is it didn't go through a mixture of cattle hooves. So. <laughs> Yes, I do, for everything. My hummingbird water I just made before I came here, same thing. <laughs> yeah. it, the pieces are sometimes a little bigger, so it might take a little longer to dissolve. But otherwise, you use it just the same as regular sugar. Sometimes, yeah. Ah. Hmm. I've never uh, had that happen. Where, yeah. 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 Like cornstarch or flour, any of that, you put it through a sieve and uh, it makes it pretty smooth. Uh, you put it through the, is that what it's called, the sieve, Steve? Yeah, so you just, you know, like sprinkle it and it makes sure that there's no clumps. And so all your recipes, they should be pretty smooth. Just one of those. I use maple syrup in place of sugar in a lot of things. I also keep a date sugar at home, which is the dried crystallized dates. Um, yeah, many options. Okay, I'm going to take two cups of washed cranberries. By the way, there's apparently a shortage this year on fresh cranberries, so you might want to grab them. Grab them while you can. 
Um, but I'm putting some onion and the fresh cranberries in my food processor. So the other thing with the Zulka sugar is it often comes out of the bag like this. <laughs> um, for whatever reason, it seems like it's gotten moist at some point, but my chunks will break down in the food processor. And then some horseradish. It's actually kind of difficult to find horseradish that doesn't have dairy in it. Uh, it quite often has either milk or egg or both, but this particular brand does not. That's a great question. I don't remember. It's one of those things that lasts so long. It's been in my fridge a while. What's that? Ah, uh, this brand is called Silver Spring. So we're going to do two tablespoons of horseradish. I lost track. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, one more. For someone that always gets distracted, like me, make sure when you're adding something to your recipe, you never put it in the same spot. I spread it out, and that way I can count my clumps. It's a little tip. Mm -hmm. So this particular brand is called Tofuti does not have tofu in it, but that's the name. And how much does it say? Three-fourths of a cup. All right. Have any of you had this cranberry? So the backstory that goes with it is one of the journalists on NPR back in the 70s um, put this recipe out there for the fans um, saying it was her mother-in-law's cranberry recipe. So it turns out her mother-in-law did use the recipe, but it was not hers. It was the editor of the, uh, or the New York Times food columnist. <laughs> so he never said anything over the years. And then finally, at some point, there was a conversation about it. And it's just kind of a cute backstory. She innocently thought her mother-in-law had created it. But um, anyway, it's different. It makes a very electric pink colored Slurry, <laughs> but it's great to make ahead because you keep it in the freezer. I've been waiting for this since last year. <laughs> Yeah. Do you like horseradish? You know, I can't say. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what? <laughs> Gotta make a face. <laughs> oh, this is uh, this is really good. <laughs> good no, answer. I'm <laughs> I don't know what I'm tasting, but. Yes, keep it in the freezer. And it thaws really quickly. It never gets like really rock hard. So it thaws very quickly. So I make it before Thanksgiving and then that morning I transfer 
transfer it to the fridge. And by the time we eat, it's perfect. It tastes like a, like a raspberry vinaigrette. Um, cold, coldish. No, the uh, regular recipe freezes well too. Yeah, so there we go. So I thought we could put a little on the meatloaf plate there. Sugar, sugar, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to ruin your your presentation. There we go. You just add more to the mountain. There we go. All right. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to clear out of your way. Whatever you'd put cranberry sauce on. Um, so if you were invited to my house this year, we are going to actually have the uh, meatloaf, and we're going to have the mashed potatoes, and green beans, and all those traditional things. But um, I like it just spooned over my mashed potatoes or on the meatloaf, too. I don't know. That's a great question. I can definitely taste it. It's not spicy. It's just supposed to be spicy. Yeah, and you can always, you know, start out with less and add more if you want to. But I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. I think it's really tasty and it's very different than what you normally the cranberry sauce you'll normally see at Thanksgiving. Um, yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I hope you give it a try. And by the way, thank you for everyone that um, sent me emails last time telling me you made the recipes. Some of you even sent me photos of your beautiful pieces of art, and that just makes me so happy. So keep those emails coming. And if you have questions, if you're trying to change your diet, that's why I'm here. Please don't hesitate to ask questions. I'm available. That's why my email address is on all of the paperwork. Just don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm happy to help. That's why I'm here. So I'm trying to clear a space for you. Oh, no worries. No rush. Why Actually, how are we? <gasps> Uh-oh. He, I did it again. <laughs> okay. Mine is actually really quick. Um, it's a really quick demonstration. So Here you Enjoy. go. Go ahead and is this enough room? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah? Okay. Everything's already right here. Is this plugged in? It is not. Is there a if you want to lift it up, I'll plug oh, it for you. Oh, here it is. Sorry, I'm a little blind. So, Brian, the reason I wanted him to come today and share this recipe is because he's part of this new wave of younger chefs that are really making a difference in the food scene. I have uh, every expectation that this guy is just, he's going places. So, I hope. yeah, and no doubt in my mind. He, um, during the pandemic, he started a cottage kitchen setup where a couple of days a week he prepares homestyle Mexican food and you order online. You drive up in front of his house, and he brings a bag of food out to your car. I highly encourage you to uh, follow him on uh, social media so that you'll know when he's doing that. Um, his food is phenomenal. 
Yeah, I think so too, but I'm a little bit. <laughs> so, um, my family. So I, did it fall? Is this better? Oh no, we were doing so well. <laughs> Gotta run over here. <laughs> Keeping you busy today. <laughs> Thank you. So you can find me. Um, I'm on Facebook, but it's mostly Instagram. The app's name is L. That's E L, and then Taco Titan. So Taco is spelled Taco T A C O. Titan is T I T A N. That's L Taco Titan. And on Facebook, you can just look up Taco Titan. It should be this uh, red picture, just like red looking character. But uh, yeah, I started that earlier this year. I adapted a lot of recipes that my mom used to make, her mom, her mom's mom. And so the, the slogan is, uh, it's, um, I had it and I forgot <laughs> it again. It's, um, oh, there we go. It's inauthentic within, in parentheses, because it's authentic, because it's the same recipe. You know, my ancestors have been using the inauthentic part is that I'm not using any meat or dairy or egg or any of that. So what I'm giving to you today is actually top secret. You're not supposed to know it, but, you know, you, I'm just so kind, so I'm going to give it to you. <laughs> the recipe seems really simple, and it is. This is the base. This is uh, pretty much like a chicken breast. You can pretend it's turkey. It's all, you know, a bird anyways. But um, so this is the base. You can, um, I'm not sure if you can really see well over there. It's kind of an ugly looking turkey that I made as a demonstration. It is not ugly. Well, I'm not the most uh, aesthetic person. I try my best, but you can really, you know, shape it however you want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> well, you guys are going to make me blush. <laughs> um, but yeah, you don't have to do any of, the, all, any of that. <laughs> You can make it into a log, you know, just a roast. You can even stuff it. So uh, I'm going to show you. It's seitan, so um, it does contain gluten. Uh, most people should be fine. But if you have celiac disease or if you have any sort of gluten intolerance, that's probably not for you, so disclaimer. But so it will start off with uh, vital wheat gluten. You are going to have to use two and a half cups of this. It's already pre-measured. So you put that in here. These are your dry ingredients. And you probably already have this at home. It's instant mashed potatoes. It's just potato flakes. Uh, there might be, I don't know, something in there to make it dry and flaky. You use one and a half cups of this. And once again, it seems really simple, but the best recipes are sometimes really simple. Because I, I wish you guys could all try that right now. But you know, just so you can see how great it is, but you just got to take my word for it or make it for yourselves. Uh, after you put all those two things in there, you want to put in your, uh, these aren't really hard to find, but they're really important. Each one plays its role. This is mushroom powder. Um, it gives it that umami taste. It's comparable to like MSG. I know some people don't really like using that, but you know, it kind of mimics the flavoring of that. It gives you a really nice flavoring. Yes, you can also get it at Amazon, or if you go to Whole Foods, they have like dry mushrooms, and you can just grind those up. But yeah, I got this one at my local uh, Asian grocery store. So you put two tablespoons of this. So Brian, uh, El Taco Titan, are you open for business Sunday? Oh yeah, well for the foreseeable future. Yeah, mm -hmm. so like she mentioned, I'm home-based, so uh, I have what's called a, a Miko. That's not really important. But yeah, so on Sundays, <laughs> you know, I, I cook food out of my house, a lot of traditional Mexican food like quesadillas, tacos, like asada, al pastor, chicken. Uh, on top of that, what I'm mostly trying to focus on are food pop-ups. So, uh, you know, we do festivals or any sort of events. I do my own festivals too. Uh, I don't know, maybe... Some of you guys might have been to Desert Veg Fest back in 2019. 
Maybe not? Okay. Well, I did those. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to start doing all vegan events come next year. So I'm also doing that, most probably in Palm Desert. So you guys can, uh, hopefully, you know, you'll be able to hear, like, oh, it's that guy. But, uh, yeah. I'll be there, too. So yeah, come see us there. both. Two tablespoons of nutritional yeast. This is, um, I forget what the word is, but you know how some people like to put beer onto their, uh, their meat because it gives it like a yeast. So these are your dry ingredients. You want to make sure that you mix these really well or else you're going to get one piece that's more black peppery than the other. Oh, this is already in my recipe. I use that for a lot of um, substitutes that I make. I didn't even know that uh, umami seasoning existed. It would probably work. It could. So um, if you try it and you love it, let me know. Let us know. This doesn't really have a lot of sodium. Well, it's 160 milligrams per teaspoon, so maybe. Yeah, I, I think you could substitute either or, actually. Uh, your sort of your final step. Um, you get two cups of water, which I have right here. And you want to add some sort of um, like bouillon. You can use veggie stock if you're not comfortable with using not chicken bouillon. So they sell these at Sprouts. Uh, they're fine. They're great. But uh, the thing with that is that you kind of have to have really hot water in order for you to like break it down. So I get this. You know, it doesn't have any chicken in it, and it tastes really chicken-like more than this. So I usually just use this. And um, the recipe calls for one cube of that, which is the equivalent of uh, two tablespoons of this. This is um, broth-based and seasoning. It's vegan. I looked up vegan um, bouillon on Amazon. I don't think they sell these in any local grocery stores, at least not that I'm aware of. But yeah, uh, just look up you know, any sort of uh, online merchant, vegan bouillon or not chicken or not beef bouillon or broth, and you should get one of these. I specifically got this one at Amazon. So you mix that together. It'll probably help if it was a little warmer, but that's all right. So once that's fully incorporated, well, actually, I should probably turn this on first. So it might be a little loud for the next two or three minutes. So I'm not sure if you guys have ever used a stand mixer. There's like five or six different speed levels. I usually put mine at number two or three. We don't want it too fast. So once that's spinning, you want to put in your liquid. slowly because if you put it in too fast, it might just make a puddle, and you don't want that. So there are a lot of seitan recipes out there. Uh, a lot of them tell you you need to like use your hands and knead it for 10 or 15 minutes you know, so you can get all those fibers in. I don't believe in that. I don't subscribe to that idea. There's nothing wrong with that if you do that, but it's, it's really messy. You know, your hands can get really dirty. This is really sticky. Uh, so uh, what I do is once this is finished, um, you know, mixing around, you'll see in about two or three minutes, it becomes this, like, log. It's really flexible and malleable. You set that in your fridge for a few hours or overnight, and it, it does this thing called autolization. It's the same thing with bread. You know, some people don't like kneading it, so they just leave it out for a bit, and it sets in by itself. Same thing with seitan. You leave it in the fridge for a few hours, and you don't have to press it for 10 or 15 minutes, because if you're making a lot of these, you know, you're going to get a carpal tunnel or something. So, yeah. I'm sorry, one more time. I'm going to get a little closer, sorry. I think a Vitamix would work, not a hand mixer, but with the Vitamix, um, yeah, I think, you should, yeah, it might get stuck to the blades. 
I've seen it done before. Yeah, but you would have to really make sure that there's enough um, liquid in there. You know what? It needs a little bit. That's one thing I forgot to mention. Sometimes two cups of water is too much. Sometimes it's too little. Sometimes the Satan doesn't agree with you. So you just add a little bit of water just to make sure that it forms a log and it'll uh, keep it going. I had something else that I was going to mention, but I forgot. Oh, yeah, so it sits in the fridge, and once you get that out of the fridge, you, you want to get some sort of broth. You can use that same chicken broth. You want to set it to a boil, not too much, because if you have a rolling boil, it might make it really spongy, and, uh, you know, you don't want that consistency. Once you're finished with the boiling, it's good to go. You can eat it just like that. And I wish I had something to show you about what I'm talking about. But what I did was once it was finished boiling, I actually put it in that cute little tin tray over there. And I, I basted it as if it were some sort of turkey. So I added plant butter. I added a little bit of this. I added thyme, sage, and some rosemary. And I made it into a thick little sauce. And I put it in the oven for an hour and a half. That's why it came out so crispy. It kind of looks like fried chicken. But it's really good. Uh, actually, I might just open it up right now just so you guys can see how like, thread-like it is. And it tastes really good. So once again, uh, this is the foundation. This is the base. You can do whatever you want with it. You can put puff pastry over it. You can stuff it. Once this thing gets going, give it another minute. Oh, there it goes. While this is going, does anybody have any questions about, like, Satan or anything, or anything at all? What's that? How did I get started cooking? So, um, a week ago, I <laughs> no, not a week ago, I started cooking. <laughs> yeah, she just found me at a Walmart, and she said, hey. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um... Five years ago, I, okay, one week ago was five years that I turned vegan, and uh, I'm sure a lot of you here who are vegan, you've had the same experiences that I did, or probably worse than I did, so a lot of my friends would jokingly be like, oh, are you vegan? Were you going to pull over to the side of the road? You're going to eat some grass? So there's a lot of these, yeah, I mean, it's funny, but, you know, when you get, like, <laughs> when you get that 20 times a day, it's a little, <laughs> you know, it, gets, it can get a little irritating. So um, I, um, I got a little, I wasn't really getting upset at the comments, but I thought, okay, well, there's got to be some sort of way to prove these people wrong. And like I mentioned, uh, my family's Hispanic, and Hispanics, they really love their food. So um, my mom, growing up, she did a lot of the cooking. And so I would just ask her, like, hey, what's in this menudo? What's in this pozole? Or how do you make this? How do you make that? And she would give me the recipe traditionally, and all I would do was omit the meat product. And that's actually super simple once I figured this out. Uh, instead of milk products, I would add soy milk, oat milk, almond milk. And during the pandemic, um, I had a lot of free time. I'm sure a lot of you did. And I got to cooking, I created this recipe, I created a lot of recipes, and I thought, okay, I'm into food. This is not really, uh, I mean, we have Chef Tanya's, we have native foods and some other places here, but this is not really a lot of vegan food. So I thought, okay, I should probably open up my, my own business. And so I would develop these recipes to prove the haters wrong. Basically, I'm just drawing out the, the question, or I mean the answer. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I basically just did it because I love food, and there's not really a lot of people who do Mexican food or vegan Mexican food well, right? Because I've had a lot of it. And I, I've had a lot of vegan food, and a lot of it, it's a brand new thing. It's just really not that good. No, not a, lo <laughs> a, a lot of it is not. Just because some people kind of... Um, True. Yeah, so... I kind of wanted to be the person to fill in the gap of, um, you know, tasty Mexican food. And, you know, there's only so much I can describe. You would have to taste it for yourselves. You know, I'm plugging myself in. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, anyways, yeah. So this thing, this is Satan. This is raw.
face down, it looks really ugly, but it's super malleable. This is what I'm talking about. So you leave this in the fridge a few hours or overnight, and this thing will totally transform. Um, it'll give it a, a different, different consistency. Uh, it's very thready. I'm not sure if you can see the fibers. Doesn't look that impressive now because it's in its raw state, but yeah, you boil this for an hour, hour and a half, and it's ready to go. You treat that as if it were like any sort of raw chicken breast or turkey, and you can you can baste it. You can put puff pastry. Uh, that's what I did with mine, but I looked like a preschooler that was trying to do an art project for his mom. <laughs> but so that you don't have to shape it like a turkey, but um, this is super amazing. I actually had Chef Tanya ask me, like, oh, what's your chicken product? Because she had my food. So if that's not, you know, testimony of how good that is, then I don't know what is. But, yeah, that's basically a demonstration. Uh, I'm not going to boil it for an hour in front of you. <laughs> yeah, <Yes>. I, <laughs> thank you. So, yeah, this, yeah, so this is set for a few hours, or you can need it for 10 or 15 minutes if you want, you know, if you don't have any time, but you get this and uh, you put it in water, enough water to cover it, I'm sorry, I mean broth. You, you want to boil it, but you don't want it to be a rolling boil because it might ruin the cons consistency, so a few bubbles, two or three. Uh, once you take that out, that's good to go. If you want to do something extravagant with it, like make a, you know, ugly little turkey, you can do that too, but yeah, treat this as if it were it a piece of chicken, basically. You can fry it. Yeah, that's what I do with mine. I um, actually marinate mine with um, this uh, chipotle sauce that I make, and then I put it with a little bit of oil, and I cook it up. And actually, the more you cook it, uh, it kind of uh, dehydrates a little bit, so it's more meat-like, because uh, you're taking away the, the moisture, and it's more thready. Uh, once again, you can't really, you know what, I'm gonna open a little piece over there. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. It does, and it's pretty cheap too. But I would only freeze it after it was done being boiled, and that would last you probably a few months. This is good in the fridge for maybe like two or three weeks, maybe a little bit more. But you don't want to push it because it might ruin the, the flavor. But yeah, don't don't freeze it in that state once it's done being boiled. So. This is crunchy. Once again, I, I put a lot of butter on it and sage and rosemary. So you can hear the crunch, but can you guys see those fibers? Yeah. It's very chicken-like. It does look like chicken. Yeah. It's very good, and it tastes <laughs> like chicken. My dad, is, uh, he's, he's diabetic now, and for many years he said, like, oh, well, I'd rather die than change my diet. And anybody can say that up until, you know, they go to the doctors, you have a diabetic coma, and, oh, the doctor tells you you have to, <laughs> you have to get rid of the meat. So he, at first, reluctantly ate my food because, um, you know, he thought, oh, you know, vegan food can be good. Once he started eating it, he thought, like, damn, it's actually good. <laughs> so even my father, who is the most uh, machista Mexican man to have ever lived, <laughs> loves my food. So, and... Um, that's really all I can say. So thank you guys for your time. I appreciate it. Get your choice. Oh gosh, I think I want the coconut amino. Oh, good choice. Mm -hmm. Hi, what would you like? Oh, there you go. Enjoy. <laughs> I 
Yeah, we got him next time. Hi, great. Uh, it's your choice. For those of you that are new to these classes, um, I generally get the ingredients for what we're making and have them available. Um, she got the one non-ingredient. She got some oat milk chocolate bars, but <laughs> I thought that would be fun to throw in there. But. Down to umami or lentils? You're the proud owner of some lentils. <laughs> there you go. You're welcome. Thank you.